Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we're going to be finishing off Chapter 5. This is Part 2 of 2 for Chapter 5. Let's go ahead and start. Uh, what I wanted to show you was an example of a contractile vacuole. You can see here, we talked about contractile vacuoles in uh, Chapter 4. And remember what they are? They are vacuoles, which are essentially a uh, membrane, but it contracts, squeezing liquid out of the, the cell. Uh, this is an example of a protist. This is paramecium, which we saw in the lab uh, during lab seven, I believe. We looked at paramecium swimming around. And it's a ciliated uh, protist with no cell wall. So if this protist were to find itself in pure water, uh, that would be a hypotonic environment and water would rush into the cell. With the contractal vacuole, this creature can squeeze that water back out and avoid lysis. Remember what happens to animal cells in hypotonic environments with no cell wall? Water rushes into the cell. You have a net flow of water into the cell. The cell swells, and then you have lysis, which means uh, the cell breaks. Okay. Uh, again, some protists have these specialized uh, organelles called contractile vacuoles, which can squeeze that water back out, uh, effectively avoiding the lysis. So that's a nifty tool to have uh, because it's going to protect you when you're in a hypotonic environment. Now, our blood cells, humans don't really have these contractile vacuoles, so our blood cells would just explode in a hypotonic environment. But because of that, uh, our body has a physiological amount of salt. Uh, does that make sense? So we, our bodies regulate how much salt is, is, in the, is, in the, is inside of our fluids, and that way we don't have to worry about that. <clears throat> so anyway, moving on, I think we already touched on these slides. Uh, uh, these are transport proteins that allow molecules through, and remember the types of molecules that go through transport proteins would be polar molecules, or charged molecules. Those are the types of molecules that go through the transport proteins. This is called a channel protein because it's simply a pore. And this is called a carrier protein, uh, which changes shape, changes conformation to allow uh, substances across the membrane. Uh, channels are usually, usually for smaller substances to cross. And carriers are usually for larger substances to cross. Oh, and we have a guest. Hey, Tig. You come to say, oh, okay. No, he's just being playful. He's, he's meowing and then running away. Hey, uh, you're not going to meow throughout the whole presentation, are you? You want to come up or no? Come on. You want to come up? No, sometimes he just wants to play. He doesn't want to actually come up. So I'm going to try to keep going and hope that he doesn't interrupt me. Oh, no, he's going off. I guess he wanted me to go play, but he, he realized I'm not going to play, so he left. Anyway, um, now everything we've talked about so far has been an example of, let me show you the slide here, passive transport. And do you remember what passive transport is? The definition's right here. Passive transport is movement of molecules through the membrane. It has to be through the membrane in which no energy is required and molecules move in response to a concentration gradient. So basically molecules are just obeying diffusion. They're following diffusion. Molecules are moving from high concentration on one side of a membrane toward low concentration on the other side of the membrane. Just like this, right? Look at these, remember these orange dots? They were high concentration on the left side of this dashed line, which is the membrane. And those substances diffused to the right where there's a lower concentration of dots. Uh, so this, this here is an example of a passive transport. Why? Because it, did it cost any energy to allow these dots to cross? Uh, these orange dots to cross the membrane? No, because they're just following diffusion. And remember, diffusion is a spontaneous process. Uh, substances will go from hot, where they're high concentration to where they're low concentration, uh, just obeying the principle of diffusion. Uh, that's a not, that's a 
that's a uh, spontaneous process. That's a spontaneous process. And do you guys remember what that means? Uh, spontaneous means negative delta G. And not only negative delta G, um, not only do, does that process happen for free, energetically for free, but energy is actually released when this process happens. So uh, when you have passive transport, uh, passive transport occurs and not only does that happen for free because it's just molecules moving down their concentration gradient, but energy is actually released and that energy can be used to do work. Okay. But what if you want to go against the concentration gradient? What if you want to go against the concentration gradient? Like for example, what if you want to bring sugar into the cell but there's already a lot of sugar inside of the cell. Well, the cell could always use more sugar, right? But the sugar doesn't necessarily want to just come into the cell because there's not so much sugar concentration outside. There's a lot of sugar already inside. Well, how will the cell get more sugar, for example? Well, that would be an example of active transport. Active transport moves substances against the concentration gradient. For instance, like I said, if there's already a huge concentration of sugar inside, but I want to bring more sugar inside, well, that's not going to be free, is it? The sugar is not just going to float in. If there's already tons of sugar inside, if there's already a lot of uh, concentrated sugar inside of the cell, um, the that's active transport. What that means is I'm trying to move a substance across a membrane against the concentration gradient. And guess what? That's going against the concentration gradient, which means it's going against the fusion, which means it's not going to happen for free. I'm sorry, it's not going to be negative delta G. That's active transport is a positive delta G thing. It's a endergonic reaction, which means it's not going to happen for free. It requires you to put in energy. Usually the energy you put in is in the form of ATP. You're going to have to waste an ATP molecule or not waste, but spend an ATP molecule to make something like active transport happen. And uh, the sodium potassium pump, by the way, is an example of an active transporter that, you know, even, even you as a human have this sodium potassium pump. So let me show you how this pump works. It's a transmembrane protein. It's a carrier protein. And uh, do you see what this pump's doing? It binds three sodium ions. These are three sodium cations, and then it pumps those three sodium cations out. And then it binds two potassium, potassium cations, and it pumps those in. But here's the thing. Look what, look what it says up here, right here where I'm, I'm circling right now. Look what it says. It says that sodium ion, sodium is already high concentration. By the way, these brackets, you see these brackets? Brackets usually mean concentration in chemistry. When you see brackets like this, that means concentration. So there's a high concentration of sodium cation outside of the cell in the extracellular fluid. But look, inside of the cytoplasm of the cell, look, there is a low concentration of sodium cation. So do you think the sodium wants to come out through diffusion? No. Diffusion means diffusion means substances want to go from high concentration to low concentration. But what is this pump doing? This pump is pumping sodium out, right? Sodium cation out. And that's going what's called against the concentration gradient. That means going against diffusion. You're not going with diffusion down the concentration gradient. You're going against diffusion, against the concentration gradient. And because of that, it's going to be a positive delta G reaction. It's an endergonic reaction, which means you're going to have to power the thing, right? And look what we have. Look, we're using ATP. We're hydrolyzing ATP and producing ADP in order to power it. Remember I said when you use ATP, you hydrolyze ATP, you cut ATP, it releases a bunch of energy. Well, through energy coupling, you can use that energy to pump the sodium cation out. And then the potassium pumps in. The potassium is high concentration inside. So the potassium didn't want to come in, but because we used this ATP, we were able to drive 
sodium ion out and potassium ion in. So the sodium potassium pump is an example of a uh, active transporter. It uses the power you know, harnessed from ATP. Uh, it uses that energy through an energy coupling reaction to pump sodium out against the concentration gradient and pump potassium in against the concentration gradient. So to review, you can see here on this slide, to review, these are three general examples of passive transport on the left, and here's a general example of active transport on the right. Let's just go through these one by one just so we can review. Again, this is kind of a review slide. Um, look here at the far left. This is called diffusion, right? Diffusion. Uh, some substances can diffuse. They can move across the membrane, right? They can diffuse directly across the membrane. Is there a transporter here? Nope. No transporter. These substances move directly across the membrane as though the membrane wasn't even there. They could just ignore the membrane. They just float right across the membrane. Do you guys remember what types of molecules I said could accomplish this. What are these purple dots? What what types of molecules do these purple dots represent? What kind of molecule can just cross the membrane uh, as though it's not even a membrane, as though it's not even there? Just ignore it and walk right through, you know, uh, not, not caring at all. Um, well, do you remember this slide? Let's go back to the slide so I can show you clearly. Look at this. Let's go back, 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 back. Back, back. Oh, here. This slide here, do you remember the permeability of the lipid bilayer? Hydrophobic, nonpolar, you know, that means nonpolar molecules such as hydrocarbons. Uh, remember molecules that are simply carbon and hydrogen such as methane, CH4, or ethane, C2H8. Uh, I don't know, oxygen. CO2, these are the types of molecules that are nonpolar and small, and they can cross the membrane as though the membrane doesn't exist. Does that make sense? So look at these purple dots again. Let's get back to that slide. Look here. These purple dots, they have to be small nonpolar molecules because the only small nonpolar molecules like the ones I just listed, those are the only ones that could just cross the membrane through diffusion. And, and another term for this is just simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is just, and look, isn't it a type of passive transport? Aren't all three of these an example of passive transport? Because you're going from high concentration of purple dots toward low concentration of purple dots. You're going from high concentration of triangles to low concentration, high concentration of blue circles to low concentration of blue circles. So all three of these are examples of diffusion, but the, only the one on the left, the, the purple dots, represent simple diffusion. The other two represent what's called facilitated diffusion. Let me explain what that means to you. So look at these triangles, right? These triangles want to go across the membrane. And look at these blue circles. These blue circles want to go across the membrane from high to low concentration. Uh, but are they? can they go directly through the membrane? No, these ones can't go directly through the membrane. So what does that tell you about the, the, the triangles and the blue circles? What does that tell you about them? Well, what that should tell you about them is that those are probably not small nonpolar molecules, right? Because if you were a small nonpolar molecule such as oxygen or CO2 or methane, you would just cross the membrane and there's actually no need to have a transporter to help you. But if you're a polar molecule, let's say these blue dots, let's say these blue dots represent uh, a polar molecule such as water or such as glucose, right? Well, can those molecules go through the membrane directly? No, no, because they're not, they're polar. What if, what if these, what if these triangles, what if these triangles represented ions like uh, sodium ion or chloride or potassium ion? Do, can those go directly through the membrane? Can those ions go directly through the membrane? No, because they're charged. Only nonpolar things can go directly through the membrane can diffuse directly through the membrane. So do you see these proteins here? 
These are called transport proteins. These are, remember, channels, I'm sorry, channel proteins or carrier proteins. These proteins are going to allow the diffusion to happen across the membrane, the passive transport to happen across the membrane. If these, if these transporters were not there, could the diffusion happen? No, because these molecules are either polar or charged. Does that make sense? So what you need to understand is molecules that want to cross the membrane that are polar molecules or charged molecules, anions or cations, right? These molecules are not just going to cross the membrane. They need help to cross the membrane. And the transport proteins are the help they need because they have a hole that allows polar and charged things to cross, okay? Um, uh, and and these holes aren't just uh, big old holes that let anything cross. They're very specific. So what do I mean by that? For example, um, there is a channel. Oops, I'm sorry. There is a channel that's specific for water. It only lets water across. And I think that was in a slide from earlier. Let me show you. Look here. Look here. Uh, there are channel proteins, right? Channel proteins. One of the channel proteins is called an aquaporin. Aqua means water, porin, basically a channel, water channels. Uh, and these allow simply water to cross. So look at this. Um, sorry, I have to skip so many slides here. Look, there might be a channel protein like this that's just for water to cross. And then have you heard of, have you heard of ion channels? You may have heard of this, uh, you know, in, uh, when you've heard about medical news or different types of drugs. Ion channels are specific for different ions. So, for example, the, the potassium channel, the potassium channel only allows potassium to cross. The chloride channel allows chloride to cross. The sodium channel allows sodium to cross. Okay, so what you all you really what I'm trying to get at is um, these transporters are not. Uh, you know, they're not non-specific. They're very specific. They, they allow certain things to cross. Like, for example, this transporter here, this carrier might be for glucose to cross. And it would be specific to glucose for crossing the membrane. Now, again, all three of these examples on the left are examples of passive transport. But look at this. These two, these two with the triangles and the blue circles, um, these two are called facilitated diffusion. You know why? Because the diffusion is not just happening on its own. The triangles aren't just going through the, to, through the membrane with no help. They need a facilitator, which means a helper. Uh, and the facilitator is in the form of a transport protein, such as a channel or a carrier. Okay, so facilit facilitated diffusion is uh, where transport proteins, such as channels or carriers, are, are necessary for the diffusion to happen, for the passive transport to happen across the membrane. So I hope that's clear. Now, um, on the right, you have an example of active transport. This means you're moving substances against the concentration gradient. So for example, look at this transporter. If this transporter was pumping out circles, because look, the circles are already high concentration outside, if this one was pumping out circles and pumping in uh, diamonds, then this is an active transporter because the circles are already high concentration outside and the diamonds are already high concentration inside. Well, then both of the, like, for example, that would be, wouldn't that be an example of, of the sodium potassium pump, right? This would be like, the, like it's pumping three sodium circles out. Uh, two, and then it pumps two potassium uh, diamonds in. That's an example of an active transporter. In this case, you need ATP energy or some kind of energy to, to facilitate that, to, to allow that to happen. Okay. This here, this slide is terminology for you. Uh, there are different kinds of these transporters. Uniporters move one molecule. Symporters move two different molecules in the same direction. Antiporters move two molecules in opposite directions. So, so let me let me just let me just break it down for you real quick. Uh, you know, for example, let's look at an antiporter. Look, remember the sodium potassium pump we discussed? The sodium potassium pump. Which one is it? Is it a uniporter, a symporter, or an antiporter? 
Well, take a look at it, what it's doing. It's pumping sodium out in one direction and it's pumping potassium in, in the other direction. So because it's pumping two different things in two different directions, it's called an antiporter. Now, if it was pumping, now here's the thing. If it was pumping the sodium and the potassium out in the same direction, it would be a symporter. Okay, does that make sense? And a unit porter moves a molecule, a, a particular molecule. So all of like this one would be a unit porter. This is a unit porter here. Okay, just it's basically these are just terms to know. Okay, so uh, with membrane potential, oh, what's membrane potential? Membrane potential is when you have active transport of ions, and that results in a voltage difference across a membrane. Uh, and your cells in your body, by the way, your cells have membrane potential. Your cells have a, a difference in charge across the membrane. And that is due to an electrochemical gradient. Let me explain an example of this. Let's say I have a, a transporter. This is an active transporter called the proton pump. What do proton pumps do? They pump protons. Here, do you remember what proton means? H plus means a proton. So this is an active transporter of protons. ATP is going to power the pumping out of protons. And so if I'm actively transporting protons out, what do I have? I have a high concentration of protons outside, don't I? Uh, this is called an electrochemical gradient. Electro because positive charges are outside and uh, relatively few positive charges are inside, which gives the inside a net negative uh, charge and the outside a net positive charge. But it's also a chemical gradient because the protons are also technically chemicals. And this electrochemical gradient, which arose because of active transport of protons, forms a membrane potential. What does membrane potential mean? There's a voltage difference across the membrane. What does that mean? That just simply means there's more positive charge on one side of the membrane and a more negative charge on the other side of the membrane. Does that make sense? So what do you need to know? You simply need to know that membrane potential means there's a voltage difference across a membrane. And active transport of ions is the easiest way to form a membrane potential. And your cells have membrane potential which may not mean a lot in this class, but when you move on to things like A and P, specifically physiology, it's going to be very important that you understand how membrane potential works because things like uh, neural interactions, neural action, uh, uh, and, and other things in your cell, uh, you know, how muscles work, etc., all depend on membrane potential. So, uh, just know that for, for this class, for membrane potential. So for example, here's another example. Remember the sodium potassium pump? This pump spends all day pumping three positive charges out, but only pumping two positive charges in. Can you see what's going to happen over time with this type of active transport? If you keep pumping out three positive charges and keep pumping in only two, well then over time you're going to have more positive charge outside and more of a negative charge inside. Okay, so the, the sodium potassium pump could also result in a type of membrane potential. Okay, now what about co-transport? What does that mean? Co-transport occurs when active transport of a solute indirectly drives transport of other solutes. So I know that, that sounds kind of complicated, so let me explain. Basically, co-transport occurs when you've got two different transporters working together, right? You've got two different transporters kind of working in cahoots. Uh, the first transporter, uh, actually, there's active transport going on with both of these. Let me, let, me, let me break it down. The first transporter is pumping protons out. It's a proton pump that pumps protons against the concentration gradient. So you have a high concentration of protons outside. And remember, this is active transport, so it requires ATP to pump all these protons out. And then what do these protons do? They feed back. They, they diffuse, right? Because you have a high concentration of protons, the protons want to diffuse back into the cell. Now, can protons diffuse directly through the membrane through simple diffusion? No, they can't. However, the second transporter in the co-transport system, the second transporter is called the sucrose uh, sucrose proton co-transporter 
it allows protons to diffuse back in, but only if they bring sucrose in as well. You see, it's because it's a symporter. It brings protons in if they bring sucrose in. So why is that special? Why is that important? Let me show you something. There's already a high concentration of sucrose inside of the cell. There's already a high concentration of sucrose inside and a low concentration of sucrose outside. So does sucrose want to enter the cell? Think about it. Does sucrose want to move from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration? Uh, the answer is no, right? Because that would be going against the concentration gradient. But that's exactly what it's doing. Sucrose is going from low to high concentration. How is that even possible? That's active transport. What's powering that active transport? Now, you might think ATP is. Well, actually, is it really? ATP is just pumping a bunch of protons out. How is that bringing sucrose in? Well, here's the answer. Here's the answer. If you want to pause for a second and think about it before I give you the answer, this is your chance. Okay. But here's the answer. Okay. Do you guys remember energy coupling? I said spontaneous reactions release energy. Non-spontaneous reactions require energy. Do you remember that? And uh, you could energy you, energy coupling means using the the energy released from a spontaneous reaction to drive a non-spontaneous reaction. Do you remember that? So look at this. Watch this. When the protons are diffusing back into the cell through the co-transporter, isn't that a spontaneous process? Isn't it spontaneous for these protons to diffuse back into the cell once they've been pumped out? That is spontaneous because the protons are diffusing. They're going from high concentration to low. And that is a spontaneous process. Spontaneous processes have a negative delta G. Negative delta G means exergonic. Exergonic means happens for free. But more importantly, in this case, not only does it mean happens for free, it means releases energy. You see that? So diffusion of protons can release energy because diffusion is a spontaneous process. What can you use that energy for? The energy of diffusing protons is being used through energy coupling to pump sucrose into the cell actively. So hopefully you understand that. In this case, you're doing active transport of sucrose, but not by ATP directly, though it's indirectly, but by diffusion, which is a different spontaneous process, uh, uh, which also in its own right produces energy. Um, and by produces energy, I mean releases energy. Obviously, energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but spontaneous processes release energy energy that can be used to do work through energy coupling. Okay, so hopefully that made sense. If it didn't, please ask me. Okay, lastly, this is the last concept of the chapter. It's called bulk transport. <clears throat> bulk transport is when you want to bring bulky items into the cell or out of the cell. You don't want to use individual transporters. You just got a bunch of stuff to release out of the cell or you got a bunch of stuff to bring into the cell. So if you got a bunch of stuff to release from the cell, that's called exocytosis, exo, outside of, cytosis, the cell, um, or a bunch of stuff to bring into the cell. That's endo, into the cell, endocytosis, endocytosis, bulk import of substances into the cell, exocytosis, bulk export of stuff out of the cell. So let's talk about exocytosis first. In exocytosis, transport vesicles migrate to the membrane, fuse with it, and release their contents. So look, it's very straightforward. Look, here. Look at this vesicle inside of the cell. So this is the plasma membrane up here. This here is a, is a vesicle inside of the cell. You remember what a vesicle is. It's basically a phospholipid bilayer ball. And these green dots represent what? These green dots represent the cargo Whatever you're trying to expel out of the cell, it could be waste that you're trying to expel. It could be a neurotransmitter you're trying to expel from a neuron. It could be hormones you're trying to expel, whatever you're trying to get rid of in bulk. This vesicle full of that cargo fuses with, you remember what I said before, a, a vesicle can attach to a membrane and then become one with the membrane, kind of like two soap bubbles coming together and becoming one, this, this vesicle can touch the plasma membrane, opening into the plasma membrane, and whatever was inside, 
gets released, expelled out of the cell into the extracellular fluid. So that's 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 a simple. It's true, super straightforward. A vesicle full of cargo, bulky bulky stuff to be exported, fuses with the plasma membrane. Whatever was inside is now outside. Is now just expelled, and this is how it's done. Okay. So what about endocytosis? Endocytosis, remember, is bulk import into the cell. I'm bringing a bunch of stuff into the cell. Okay. And there's two types. Uh, right here it says there are three types of endocytosis, but you only care about two of them. You only need to worry yourself about two. One's called phagocytosis and one's called pinocytosis. Uh, phagocytosis is bulk import of solids. That's why it's called cellular eating. And pinocytosis is called uh, bulk import of, of uh, liquids. That's why it's called cellular drinking. Okay. So in phagocytosis, let me show you. In phagocytosis, the solid attaches to the cell membrane. So this is the cell membrane. You want to bring in this, this uh, bulky substance, this bulky, bulky uh, cargo. This bar bulky cargo touches the plasma membrane. The, the plasma membrane starts folding inwards, encapsulating the, the substance to be transported. This is, this is called phagocytosis. And the plasma membrane will actually wrap around the cargo and then pinch off, just like soap bubbles, right? The plasma membrane can pinch, pinch, pinch until it pinches off as a vesicle uh, or a vacuole, and it, this would be a bulk import. And now you've brought in the solid. Now in pinocytosis, remember pinocytosis means cellular drinking because instead of bringing in a solid this way, you're bringing in a liquid this way. So the membrane invaginates, which means fold inward. It pinch, pinch, pinch until it pinches off and it brings liquids in. And do you see these blue dots and these stars? Those represent any substance that's dissolved in the liquid. Okay, so basically you're bringing solution in. And that solution is not necessarily pure water. It's whatever's dissolved in the pure water as well. Okay, so with that, I think we have finished this chapter. This is chapter five, part two of two. Uh, that's all we're going to do for chapter five. Uh, thanks for watching. Let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you next time.